or good evening to all. Mabuhay from Baliwag University, Philippines. Welcome to the Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. And as we all know, the holiday season is really around the corner. So from the Philippines, let me greet everyone a maligayang Pasko or Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays to all! I am Hasmin Tayao, the Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs of Baliwag University, Philippines, your moderator. How about ending the year right with the second session of this webinar series? This webinar series, which will be conducted every third Friday of the month from November 2021 to April 2022, is brought to us by Baliwag University in cooperation with University College of Estate Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the OPEDUCA Project, and Maastricht University. Well, last November 19th, we started this series with an insightful, comprehensive, and data-driven introduction to sustainability. Such a very good start to ignite our passion and increase our level of awareness and action about sustainable future. For our webinar guidelines, kindly use your complete name and your institution or affiliation as your Zoom account name. Please keep yourself on mute. Well, if you have a question, you may type it in the chat room and share your ideas. Allow me to share some gentle reminders about your participation to this webinar series. Shaping Sustainable Future. Okay. So Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series is comprised of six online events or short workshop events. Second, the six online events will take place on the third Friday of every month from November 2021 to April 2022. At the end of the six online events, each participant will receive certificate of participation in Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. Evaluation of the activity will be done before ending the program. Well, it is such a delight to see all of us, all the participants from various countries, from different sectors for a shared purpose. That is, we are here, we're coming together for a sustainable future. At this moment, to formally welcome us all to this virtual engagement, let us have the president of Baliwag University, Philippines, our very own, Dr. Patricia Bustos Lagunda. Dr. Lagunda. Thank you, Dr. Tayao. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of, and the Administration of Baliwag University, Philippines, let me extend my warm virtual welcome to all to this Shaping for Sustainable Futures Together seminar series. Also, I'd like to welcome back those who have joined us in the first seminar during the start of the sixth series, uh, and that was last November 19. And to those who have just joined now, we hope that you will be with us in the re remaining four webinars. I have a sense that people are on holiday mode already, so maybe we'll have more when January kicks in. This online series is a brilliant idea of our cooperation with the University College of Estate Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the Open Duca Project, and Maastricht University, as earlier mentioned. As we have already kicked off this webinar series, we have started to further our knowledge, awareness, and level of action on our respective roles to promote sustainability from various societal sectors involving scholars, university students, school leaders, government policy developers, managers from mid-scale and larger industry, as well as NGOs. And we hope to have more of them no, uh, come January and then up to April. Our delivery team, Baliwag University's visiting fellows for global sustainability, 
will provide our participants with action-based perspective, envisioning the empowerment of participants to take an active role in shaping a sustainable future. Specifically on topics of our webinars, we started with introduction to sustainability. Today is system, systems thinking and problem analysis, the meaning and impact of the SGDs, that's the third, followed by sustainability leadership, then global sustainability and corporate social responsibility, and last would be leading sustainable transformation. The pillars of sustainability, uh, and this is made up of human, social, economic, and environment, environmental uh, factors, need our deliberate efforts of action in order to meet our present needs without compromising the ability of the next and future generations. With this, I enjoin everyone to complete the series until April, as mentioned earlier, every third Friday of the month. Please devote two hours of your time to learn and uh, pick up the best practices in sustainability. In closing, I wish all of us a productive and meaningful webinar on systems thinking and problem analysis. I am delighted that you have chosen to spend today uh, an afternoon with Dr. Renuka Takor, Dr. Yos Yusen, and Mr. Ku Hok On, and together with them, as we learn from them, let's work towards a sustainable future. Thank you very much and stay safe, everyone. And of course, Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. Back to you, Hasmin. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lagunda. Indeed, all of us are looking forward to completing the remaining webinars and, of course, become agents of sustainable future. At this juncture, let me give the virtual floor to Dr. Francia R. Santos, Country Coordinator of Global Sustainable Futures, to introduce the Baliwag University Visiting Fellows for Global Sustainability or the members of the delivery team. Dr. Franz? Thank you so much, Dr. Jasmine Tayao. So I would like to thank also our president, Baliwag University president, Dr. Patricia Lagunda. She is also the Global Sustainability uh, Network Coordinator. So she is a recipient also of the Gold Certificate of Appreciation from GSFN. Okay, so our first uh, member of the delivery team is actually the team lead of this uh, Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. So she's providing a collaborative platform for innovative and transdisciplinary partnership and capacity development for the early career researchers joined by senior experienced researchers from the Global South and the Global North. So Dr. Takor believes in the broader sustainable development concept and she's using multi-dimensional lens. Uh, she's also, okay. The founder of the Global Sustainable Futures, and she's proud to have more than 1,000 1, coordinators from more than 100 countries worldwide. So let's all welcome Dr. Renuka Takor. So let's give her a round of applause. Okay, the next member of the team. So I'm so honored uh, to introduce to you also the second member of the team. He's coming from a 20 years career uh, in private industry. He is an economist. He became a CFO and CEO, and he is also a social entrepreneur leading the RCE Ryan Views. He is the first of 174 regions worldwide binding together the knowledge and action of the industry. So, uh, Dr. Joss Yusen is also the founder of the Opeduka Project, which is also a partner of this sustainable uh, series. Okay, so let's all welcome now the lecturer of sustainable development and climate change from Maastricht University. So once again, let's welcome Dr. Joss Yusen. And then the last but not the least, 
member of the delivery team is the one providing sustainability uh, related advisory services for agriculture forestry project development. He has been involved, okay, in managing also um, in, yeah, environmental management. He is also an expert in agriculture. So let us all welcome the convener for Global Sustainability Summits and Dialogues, Global and ASEAN Green Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Ku Hak Aeon. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Francia. As what the theoretical physicist Albert Einstein says, problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. With this, let us all learn together with this second webinar of our Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series entitled Systems Thinking and Problem Analysis. May I now give the spotlight to the members of the delivery team. For the information of our group, they will entertain your questions during the open forum of our program. Dr. Takor. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, can you just confirm that you can see my screen properly? Yes, we can see your screen good, properly you. and we can, we can hear you clearly. Also. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, extremely pleased to be here and grateful to my Beliga organizing team, Dr. Patricia Legunda, my dear friend and network coordinators, Dr. Francio Santos, Ku Hawk, uh, and, and Professor Joss Hussein, who is also part of our uh, delivery team. So I'm very grateful for organizing this uh, seminar at Belugua University and led by uh, Rina Flor Castro. So here today, we are going to uh, spend some time discussing what is systems thinking. And I will be mainly uh, talking about the theoretical framework, and then it will be led by uh, Jaws for you to think into why it is important or how you can manage it or how you can uh, look through it. And then following that, we will have Ku who will uh, give you some practical ap applications in uh, how, it is, how it is in real world. So I'm very thankful and I acknowledge the support of University College of Extent Management uh, Belugua University, the Ope de Dusa project and Maastricht University. And especially I'm very proud of being here for, from my network, Global Sustainable Futures Progress to Partnership. So today is the workshop two, systems thinking and problem solving. As I already mentioned, we will drill into the concept of systems thinking today, and we will try to understand its applicability for problem solving or problem analysis. I might go, if our time permits, we can go into methods and approaches for system thinking, and then uh, I will uh, hand over it to uh, Dr. Josh. So here, first I want to start with what do you understand by the idea of systems? And what are the basic principles of systems thinking? Could you please write down in the chat for five minutes? And if, if anyone really wants to speak, then they can take the mic and also speak. So I would like you to write down in the chat and I will be looking at your answers, please. What do you understand by the idea of system? And so I will write down two questions here. Okay. We haven't got many answers. Come on. Okay. We have got one answer here. System is consolidated with elements and functions. And he's absolutely right. He's 
Sri Ramnath Mandali, and he's absolutely right. Okay, we are getting now some few answers. Very good. Okay, someone has said, uh, Bela has said, a holistic approach to analysis that focuses on the way that a system's const constitute parts, interrelate, and how systems work over time and within the context of larger system. Perfect. System thinking means holistic thinking of systems, its underlying interlinkages with interconnected aspects. Brilliant. Uh, system thinking is a way to understand a subject with the help of system. Good. Define processes, interrelationship, awareness of impact on the other parts of the organization. Perfect. Interconnection of factors, structures, functions. Yes. An ideal problem solving framework for sustainability. Ideal. Okay. Very good. Systems thinking, structured ways, and processes of achieving shared goals. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. System thinking giving us perspective that most of the time various components affect each other in various ways. Yes, I like this. Yeah. Okay. I will stop here now because exactly these are the answers of what I was looking for. And exactly, we all have these uh, impression or our understanding of systems thinking. And I'm going to mainly speak the same words here, but we will also have to think how we apply them or how do we really, really think always of our problems through systems thinking. And so here, uh, let me go ahead and thank you for your input. So the idea of system is not modern concept, actually. It has origin from 17th century. In literature, I am talking. Actually, in our culture and these, uh, like in our behavior and culture, in embedded in our decisions. And it, it is from many, many, many years ago. Like it, it is since our uh, existence, probably but it has become more evolved and uh, more complex. But since then, now I'm talking about literature here, that since 17th century, it has been discussed almost in all the disciplines. And that is in physics, in biology, in chemistry, and eventually it is also used in explanation of now, ecology, engineering, economics, anthropology, geography, sociology, cybernetics, and so on. So now it is very common to apply this systems thinking in almost all disciplines. And so it is, it was, it is now coined as a meta discipline or a meta language by Chucklin and Scholes in 1999. Using the ideas of systems, this Chucklin made some very seminal work in, uh, in, on systems thinking since 1981. And he has plenty of papers around it and he has developed the literature around it. And according to him, systems thinking is about consciously organizing thinking process. And it is also a critical thinking, which Josh will touch on, uh, uh, critical thinking uh, or decision-making, thinking about all your alternatives and how we should go forward. So here I, in this slide, you can see the map and you might be, whenever you are talking about any problem, you will be thinking about what is the context? What have we found out? What to do next? Or what was the purpose of the system? Or what happens in here in this system? how we can analyze that and how we can understand each part of the system and its influence on each other. So this is what we are talking here. So according to GLEG, 200, uh, GLEG 2000, systems thinking is a worldview which all allows appreciation of holistic thinking, having interconnection between the elements. So whenever it is a part of anything, a system, so for example, it is a car. Car is also on its own a one system. And when we are talking about car and if we are talking about a steering or any one part of the, uh, the uh, 
uh, car, then we can say that that is one element of that system. And uh, when it, it is also called components. So system and components, generally they are used uh, into, uh, uh, like uh, it can be used anytime and they are interchanged. You can see these in this background again, the same uh, slide. And you may think that these are the internal structure and how they are dependent on each other. That is the main importance of this system thinking that we have to understand that dependence on each other. And importantly, what is important in this system thinking that these elements are just not only non-human elements. They are human elements and non-human elements. And therefore we previously, when someone said that it is a function and the process, so whatever the uh, uh, function, process, and also it, it relates on your behavior, your decision-making. So you can think that it involves human and non-human components. And, and this, uh, uh, they are established in a wider and linked processes. So any, any uh, human does the decision and, the, and that uh, uh, non-human element functions or does the process. And these techno and therefore we can think that there are technologies which are non-human components. So that is a technical part and the social part, which is human component. And they are the users of that system. And therefore, you must be always thinking about all these relationship and all these components and elements within a system when you are talking about a, uh, a system or when we are trying to analyze a system and solve a problem through this system thinking. So now these system components contribute to a properties called drivers, outcomes, and feedback. And it is, it is applied to the problems of multiple disciplines. So mainly there are, we, we can uh, analyze a system by thinking that, okay, this is the driver of the system, then this will be the up outcome. And when there is an outcome, we may not get the desired outcome and we will, find, we will find that something needs to be feedback to the system. So there is an iterative loop around this, always in a systems thinking. So now I will speak about five basic principles of systems thinking. They are generally very uh, embedded within our decision-making, but we must be conscious. We must be knowing these principles so that we can deliberately apply them in systems thinking. And so first is the big picture principle. And big picture principle demands you to widen your perspective and find more effective solution. Even in the stressful time, one must not be focusing on the immediate answer or immediate response. Yes, we must be doing, we must be taking some immediate response, but we must be talking up, thinking about the long-term response, uh, long-term its consequences, so that we can deal with its uh, uh, adverse impact if the immediate in re response has an, any advert, if adverse impact. So we must be looking at a very big picture here and investigate any problem in an effective solution, for, for an effective solution. The second principle is long-term, short-term principle. And this again relates with the earlier point which I made, that yes, we need to put, uh, have some short-term uh, solution, but we must always think about the medium and the long-term solution so that we do not uh, uh, fall into the fall of any adverse effect of the short-term uh, solution. And if we are thinking about the long-term, then even if we have done something wrong in a short-term, we, we must evaluate, go back and see whether we have done it properly. And so if there, are, if there is any adverse effect, we can uh, immediately address it without going into further adverse effect. 
The third principle is dynamic, complex, and interdependent principle. And therefore, we must avoid simplification. Yes, just let do it. Yeah, we, when, when we thought about delivering this uh, series, we had to go through series of conversation, dialogues, discussion, how we will deliver, where we should we deliver, how we will manage them, and what will be the consequences of it, and what will be the outcome of this, and how will it impact the wider society, and so on. So that is, we have to think about all these things, and they are all interrelated. How you deliver, how you design your delivery that is more important than what what the outcomes come out and therefore from the start of your thinking you have to keep a wider vision big picture long-term uh, perspective and the dynamic nature of this system thinking and also within the though we might be sometimes also thinking about that okay there are interdependence between uh, the components within the system, but also the components are uh, interacting to the outer, uh, outer environment. And therefore, we must be thinking about their impacts in the outer environment, external environment that is called uh, of external environment to your system. The fourth one here, the measurable versus non-measurable data principle. And here, this is very important because mainly or traditionally our policies have been developed by quantitative analysis showing that, okay, if we do this, then this is going to happen. So for example, we have always thought about return on investment or if we invest this much, then we will get the returns this much in a positive form anywhere. However, we must be talking about the non-measurable data that is the quality. Quality and more attitudinal, moral, this all should also come into our thinking. So we must match our qualitative and quantitative data for any decisions. And the, finally, the fifth point is we are part of the system. Remember, we are wherever in whichever the system we take uh, are, even if it is like a car, we are the part of that system, okay? And we have to decide because we are the decision maker, we are the designer and we are the decision maker. So we have to, we are, uh, it all depends on what we decide, how we decide and how we deliver and therefore, we must be more focused on thinking of known unintentional consequences that whatever we have decided and what we have uh, uh, implementing uh, for the outcome, the outcome must be that only and not the unintended outcome. And so we must be very worried about the unintended outcomes when we are taking the decision and dealing with this uh, systems thinking. And sometimes these unintentional outcomes are also kind of mental assumptions and values and beliefs, and they, uh, uh, they uh, have an adverse in impact. So generally, system thinking is uniquely based uh, nowadays because of this all uh, literature and awareness of system thinking. It is now generally uh, discussed as a complex system, uh, systemic issue and used as a language to uh, discuss or, or, or to analyze a problem, okay? And it is, again, you know, uh, when we are talking about the language, every professional or uh, different disciplines use different language, different terminology. And sometimes if we are talking about very rigid language of system thinking, then people might not get it. And therefore, you there are several different synonyms used. And uh, you may not be aware or conscious that you are applying some, some uh, system thinking in your thinking, but you are definitely doing so. So for, for example, today you have come to uh, attend this 
a seminar, then you must have thought about how I'm going to attend, what I'm going to move uh, because you have to make some time for this series and so on. So in, in our conscious mind, like we are def definitely thinking of system thinking, but here I'm talking about uh, deliberately applying these principles so that we can analyze uh, uh, worldwide, uh, real world problems to have uh, better solutions. And so now I stop here again for the second uh, discussion point, which is applicability of systems thinking for problem analysis. So the question here is how system thinking can be used for sustainability, or could you think of various system commonly used in environment or societal context and how system thinking can be applied? I will write down these two questions in the chat and you are welcome to write in the chat or you can also write down in, uh, 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 take the mic and speak if you want. Okay, so probably you can have some answers to the questions or the challenge of Dr. Takor uh, regarding uh, her question, uh, depending on our respective areas or respective disciplines as to, let me just uh, repeat the question. Uh, how systems thinking can be used for sustainability? Uh, can we think of various systems commonly used in environmental or societal context and how systems thinking can be applied? Uh, Dr. Takor, so there is an answer already from Sir Kelkar and Sir Mandali. Would you like me to read their answers for you? Yeah, yes, carry on, you can read. Yeah, okay. So for uh, Sir Kelkar, we can solve sus the sustainability issues with integrating the various parts of the environmental issues and try to find the relationship. From yes. Sir Man uh, yeah, Sir uh, Dr. Takor. Yeah, I can read now, don't worry. Uh, okay, yes. uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yes, we can solve the sustainability issues by integrating the various parts of the environmental issues and try to find the relationship. Uh, secondly, we have seen we can solve energy related problems like uh, sun radiation versus uh, solar cell emit emittance, light flux and reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Exactly, so here, these both examples show that the environmental issues in the sense of our light, uh, I mean, uh, energy, where, uh, where the energy is source, so source of energy, the use of energy, and uh, due to the use and source of the energy, uh, the, uh, the impact of the energy use that is on the environment, whether we are doing any pollution or how we are using the energy and uh, how we are, due due to our use of energy, how we are using the natural resources and so on. And so this is, these are two really good example of showing the interrelationship of many, many parts of our environment uh, in our real world. And therefore, uh, to understand these all interactions, we must be 
applying systems thinking. Here, someone has said system thinking can be utilized in bettering the operational aspects by better renewed approaches. Exactly. Uh, secondly, in organization systems consist of people, structure, and processes that work together to make an organization healthy or unhealthy. Brilliant. Uh, reuse, recycle, refurbished, regenerate are some of the examples of circular economy. Exactly. So here we are. It, it, the system thinking makes us uh, think about what are the impacts, mainly its impacts, and therefore uh, whether there are those impacts are positive or negative on any other part of the system. And if it is something like that, then we must be resolving it. Here we have more answers now. System thinking is a powerful tool that help us better navigate the complexity and dedicate balance and the socio-political and natural ecosystem within which our business operates. In order for any business to become resilient, to withstand the shocks and stress in their value chain, they must apply a systemic perspective. Applying a system thinking approach to sustainability enables us to better see and understand the impacts of our business decision and avoid unintended consequences. It also enables us to explore opportunities for innovation and design our approaches for system change. Be it incremental changes or broader changes, we want to find a practical way for us to be responsible for the impact of our work has a people uh, on the planet, on people and planet. Brilliant. I think she's reading my PhD there. It can help us in formulating problems that are supportive from each other. Human person is considered as important resources for balanced and integrated development. Okay. It can be used also to solve climate change and other environmental issues associated with climate change. This can help how people can, uh, how people can help solve climate change in both micro and micro level. But brilliant, because I'm going to touch on this exactly. Okay, so I think I uh, we have one more. Sorry. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. Um, yes. So I asked. Uh, Anise mentioned uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and she, uh, she, uh, I asked, give an example. So he became famous because of his painting. He had he was a re Renaissance man, mathematician, geologist, analogist, biologist, and sought to learn every possible source and was manifested by the interconnection of found learn to see and urge realize that everything connects to everything else. And the uh, Viterians man is a systems thinking example, more than an illustration of human pr proportions. It is the synthesis of anatomical, geological, and uh, geometrical, uh, religious, and philosophical studies, and the way greater than the sun of its part. Okay, here, here I, I would think that he, yes, absolutely. As a system thinker, he might have found the interconnections of many disciplines. But what I believe in his in his own personality that he was a transdisciplinary person in the sense of he used to use several disciplines and come to a new level of uh, understanding, which is called transdisciplinary. And I'm also going to touch on that. So thank you very much for putting the uh, like preparing the platform for my for the slides. Thank you very much. So here I will share now. Um, before going into details of these applications, we must also need to understand that why we, we need to think differently. Why what we are thinking just traditionally and the way we are behaving is not really, really impactful or or um, uh, beneficial for our sustainable development. So, and here I again mentioned that concept sustainable development, and I would like to uh, remind you that last workshop was focused on sustainable development. And so 
If you do not know what is sustainable development, then you can go into our first uh, workshop series and listen to the recording. And if you are new to or first time attending this series, then you may ask the organizer, then they, they can send you the recording of the first uh, workshop. And, and there you will find the understanding of sustainable development. And therefore taking the broader sustainable development, we must also focus on the 17 sustainable development goals, which, can, which targets on zero poverty, reducing inequality and so on. And therefore we need this understanding of systems thinking. Now, traditionally, societal system, you know, what we have, we have food system, transport system, housing system, educational system, and they are relatively close, actually. Uh, wherever you go to find a house, you might be thinking, oh, is my school very nearby? Or is my station nearby? Or am I having a... a uh, superstore nearby. Why you are thinking? Because they are all closely related. And therefore, if we keep thinking as usual and make decisions uh, like usual in the sense of just in the systems, uh, just one system, then it is not proper because the uh, it is deeply root, uh, uh, our practices are deeply rooted in our decision making and they need to they need to be changed we must be looking from the uh, by combining the technological change and the social change and the environmental change and the cultural change and the international and local change and all we must be looking into all these uh, changes whenever we are talking about our process and what we need to change, okay? And, uh, and mainly uh, uh, we must be overcoming the uncertainties between these uh, systems and our decision-making because we do not understand the systems of all the systems and definitely one person cannot understand everything. And therefore there are uncertainties. But if we get together and we uh, combine our knowledge from one system to another system or within the parts of the system, then we can decrease those uncertainties. And therefore we must overcome this multiple and deep uncertainties. And we must more and more understand the dynamic interrelationships or interdependencies of the wider values, cultures, and institutions, and cross-scale global and intergenerational problems. Now, there are other arguments also supporting the transformation of theoretical framing. Like uh, when you are here, when you are listening to the series, you have a theoretical framing that I will gain some knowledge, and therefore you want to do this. And any decision, so decision to attend this series is that, that the, you have an argument that you will get a knowledge. So there is a, a, a outcome of this series, uh, attendance to this series. And therefore uh, we have to think of all these outcomes. Now, when we are talking from the, uh, now when we look at the history of decision-making, uh, we naturally wanted economic development. And therefore, we went for the economic framing. And that encouraged the model capitalism and globalism. And we have attained that definitely at, at, at individual level and at national level, we have become prosper. Uh, pros we have gained prosperity. We have gained economic uh, uh, outcome. But we have impacted our environment by doing that. So we lost that, uh, uh, our thinking on that environment and we lost our resources. Likewise, we also then later thought about our social framing. We looked at, through the social framing and we thought that we must make people prosperous. We must give everyone what they need. But while we are thinking this or while we are doing this, we have uplifted the poverty in, on the whole world. And we are now left with only very less percent of poverty. 
which is really, really good achievement. However, we have to use natural resources to do that. And therefore we must, uh, and unlimited resources will be used in these things. And therefore we have to be conscious. We have to form a balance where we want to stop and where we want to manage. Uh, likewise, if we are looking from the organizational framing, there also we, uh, it uh, populates or encourages the investment into the capital building. That is, we have to grow, grow, grow. But this is also again, not good. And uh, from the pol political framing, we have regulations, but sometimes regulations are also very hard and they are hard to achieve and then they fail to give out the real pro uh, outcome. And therefore, what we need, we need all the framings to come together. And therefore we need to transform theoretical framing and that will transform our purpose and that will transform our outcomes. And therefore these dynamics of this complex uh, system, we need to uh, think and uh, build into our uh, systems thinking. Now, as I already said, that system thinking has been uh, from, uh, contested or debated from long time, and therefore various uh, models of system thinking have, pre have been presented. And I have named here only a few of them, which I, I am applying here, uh, and they are mainly commonly applied into our real world. Coupled human and natural uh, system, where this system looks at the human and the environment. However, when we just, when we look at human and environment, then we must, we fall sort of those social aspects. And therefore we must be uh, thinking of other system as well. Now, another system, uh, model, system thinking model is given by Gills, which is socio-technical system. And it looks at social and technical. So here there is again fall of environment. And uh, though the socio-technical system has been very, very popular throughout the world because of the users, social is, uh, social is users and the technical is the technical or products which give us. And that has gone very far, like uh, has been very advanced in our uh, society because you, it, it is always uh, thought that customers are the king of the products and therefore, uh, uh, users uh, influence the technical or product side and the products are changed or developed according to what the user want. And that is how our socio-technical system work. Now, complex adaptive system is a system where, uh, and it is mainly at the organizational level and it is uh, it, it, it looks into the internal environment and the external environment. And it, it is a complex adaptive system, which means that the internal environment of the system must be adaptive, adaptive to the external environment. So for example, new regulation has been uh, implemented, then they must address the problem or the address the pressure of the regulations coming on their internal system. And they must be also aligned with the high level landscape policies going on outside the system. And, and then only your organization would be comp at the competitive age, would be able to uh, address any pressures coming from the external environment. And just now at this moment, I think, it is very important because uh, uh, the problem like COVID from the external environment has so much pressure on the internal environment of the systems like any organization. And therefore they must adapt to the uh, different forms of uh, operations or, uh, or any other processes so that they can uh, uh, be resilient and they can address this problem effectively. Just as we are now going on online teaching from the classroom uh, teaching. So these are very important. And finally, I would bring, uh, like to bring into the broader concept of sustainable development in response to paradigm shift of this framing and decision-making, which I spoke earlier uh, in two slides that 
having all this uh, knowledge in mind, we must bring now, we must go into the broader conception, uh, conceptualization of sustainable development. And I will be talking to it uh, in, in future slides, I will be talking more on it. So here, first, let me go into the uh, socio-technical system a little bit more, which talks about multi-level perspective of socio-technical system. And uh, someone has already mentioned about micro and macro. And But I would also like to in, uh, introduce you to meso level, which is the current level, which we are all working in. And that is called regime also. And that is uh, that regime is like a mainstream, what, what mainstream is doing. Macro is the global level where all the policies, global level policies, for example, uh, uh, at globally, we have thought that there is a um, uh, global warming and everyone has accepted that we must reduce global warming and we have adopted that climate change is there and there is a climate change policy at a very high level, which is called macro. And these are putting pressures on us. Like a, while micro is at an individual level or a very small scale level where innovations are going on or people are working on their own. And, but they are also trying to uh, influence the regime level depending but the pressure is also from the macro level. And someone like me have thought about developing this network and I developed the network, but now it is a mainstream because we have 1000 people. So something like that. So each individuals are doing their own work, but they are pressured by the mainstream as well as the macro level. But they, then those innovations can fill into the mainstream. And, and there is a potential of actualizing the transition then. And the transition becomes, uh, uh, it ha happens into the MISO level. And I will explain more on that by bringing that how this transition happened. So here, as I already mentioned that the individual level, and you can see uh, here is the niche where, where at the bottom uh, side niche and innovation, he said, many people do innovation. And I'm sure here also, I have seen whoever are speaking and answering here, they are a part of innovative system here. You know, they must have gone into something detail and they show that they have done some innovation here. And these innovations remain in their own until they get the market in the meso level to flourish and to uh, influence the mainstream. And, and that can influence can only happen when that window opens. And, and the window opens when there is a pressure from the high level and the impact or the uh, working of the innovation works. When these two meet, they can become a main level. Um, uh, uh, they can flourish at the meso level. So for example, initially we had only one or two type of cars, but later on uh, it happened so that we were able to, uh, the pressure was such from the high level or the globalization and so on that technologies, uh, various technologies developed and finally cars got the mainstream and now they are so common that each house might have one car. So it is something like it takes time to become into mainstream, but it is always started by individual and then it goes into mainstream pressured by the global policies or pressured by the global environment. And this is how uh, it works in a uh, socio-technical system. And this multi-level perspective is very important. Here, this uh, Gills has mentioned of only three levels, but I say there are multiple levels in between. If you drill into it, there are multiple levels, but we are not going into too many details, but you might have to, when you are talking about problem solving and analysis, you might have to go into many, many details of this. Now here I'm talking about the complex adaptive system and which I like the most because that 
applies to individual and at organizational level, as well as at the higher level. And here, this uh, figure one explains the internal uh, mechanism that it is dynamic, uh, it is a, a quasi equilibrium is uh, happening, that is, there is an emergence. So when there is a pressure from outside uh, environment, the internal environment changes, they try to adjust to it, try to find the solution to it. And there is a quasi equilibrium that is, yes, this is nice, this is not. And so there's a trial type uh, uh, phase is going on. And then once they are happy with what it is, then there a new property emerges out of that old uh, environment. And that new property is called emergence. Uh, I'm talking about these terminologies which may not be very familiar to you, but I'm sure we, we visualize, we experience in our daily lives. <clears throat> Sorry. And then now uh, in this second figure, I explain different three parts, which I already mentioned drivers, uh, 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 decision making and the outcomes and agents, uh, whoever, they can be human and non-human, as I already mentioned in the system thinking, they are the agents of working, <clears throat> working in a system. And they have particular governing rules, or you can say the principles, or you can say the values, mission of that organization, and they work accordingly. So I can give you an example that here in UK, we have a target of achieving 20 uh, uh, and uh, reducing energy use by 80% by 2050. So that is my target, okay? When I'm, if I'm in an organization and if that target has been uh, adopted by me, then that is my target. Then the all agents in the organization will try to work towards that target. And so that target becomes our governing rule. It governs our actions and the agents do the action. And then the outcomes come out of it. And, the out, and they are called systems outcome. And what should be the outcome? The what outcome should be in relation to the target, isn't it? The desired outcome. But sometimes we do not reach the target. And therefore these systems need to feedback that what were the problems or not achieving those targets or what were the challenges, they are called challenges, and or what were the uncertainties we uh, uh, encountered while we, were doing, while we were doing this. And there, so there is a feedback loop. And therefore any system is an iterative process. It has a feedback loop and it is iterative process. Now here I have a very complex figure which is about in, integrated complex adaptive and socio-technical system. I have given here just to uh, absorb. I won't go into too many details here because when I'm talking about the, in the future workshop, when I'm talking about the leading sustainable futures or leading your uh, sustainable transformation, I will be touching on this and talking about this. So, uh, there are other examples. Now this, this figure is the development of my PhD, my product of my PhD, and I'm very proud of it, that I was able to bring all the uh, system thinking and different aspects, uh, say various uh, principles and uh, think, uh, processes of system thinking into this. However, uh, it is not actually, we cannot, I cannot claim that it is the absolute answer, but it is a framework which can allow you to decide and move forward uh, towards your sustainable uh, transformation. And I have already applied this model for two examples. And this is a English housing system where I have applied to achieve energy efficiency and sustainability in housing sector. And secondly, I have applied here and I have my all these papers out and they are uh, in open access so you can read them. But even uh, following workshops, I will explain them in a lot of details. Uh, this example is on 
at a workplace that how we can cha bring change in on a work in a workplace where it is user friendly that is the employee friendly and it is also preferred by the employers so you can see that the users uh, and the tech so socio technicals that is and i have also brought complex adaptive system so i have brought in several uh, aspects of different systems in here and presented this model and it works at least it has worked for these two cases okay so now uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I will stop for methods, but I will just speak on, I won't go into discussion or anything, but I will quickly just tell you a few things that when we are talking about system thinking, we must be looking at how, why, what questions, and therefore we must be looking at qualitative research, uh, that which I touched upon earlier also, and we must also be, and these are few things about qualitative research, but we must also looking at quantitative research because facts, return of values, return of investment, they are very important in our organization or anyone who does anything. And therefore we must be looking at the qualitative research also. And here again, qualitative research, I have made few things on that. These are all very common uh, thing and you can find outside also, they are not too much related to any complexity or system thinking, but these methods must be applied for system thinking. And therefore, when we are talking about qualitative and quantitative, we must be applying to uh, mixed methods, which can bring both uh, uh, aspects of both uh, methods, qualitative and quantitative. And here, uh, yes, uh, therefore it is again, I will go back to one of those answers and discussion of transdisciplinarity because that is very important that when we are looking into one system and you have already now made an uh, understanding around that, that any one discipline cannot solve your uh, problem. Uh, looking only from the sociological point of view or only looking from the physical point of view or only looking from the technological point of view, you cannot solve. And therefore we must be transdisciplinarity, uh, apply transdisciplinarity, transfer our uh, disciplines to uh, another level and i will show you in this slide now um okay yes one another thing is that in a system thinking it is very very important to have a balance between all these uh our objectives we might have social objective we might have environmental objective we might have technological objective and we need to ensure a balance also, it is very important to conscious building, consensus building between different perspectives of the participants giving uh, value or valuing that system. So knowing employees and knowing employers and the other stakeholders of your organization is very, very important. And again, this quantitative and qualitative relates to objectivity and subjectivity. These all are very, uh, uh, specific terminology, but I'm sure you are using these things in daily life without knowing it, okay? Uh, and uh, we will come across several examples in the following uh, series, workshops, and you will, uh, we will try to make you, uh, uh, explain you this again and again. Now, when I was talking about transdisciplinarity, this is, that, that it is discipline one, discipline two, so any discipline. I'm talking about say mathematics, physics, so sociology, social science, and so on. And if we bring all these disciplines, then they, it should allow everyone to engage and go to a new level of understanding. And that is called uh, transdisciplinarity. And that is very, very important in uh, systems thinking and problem solving. And here again, I have showed subjectivity and objectivity. And uh, again, this, this one thing is very important here is that users 
are for, form the main part of the system. And they are, whatever the knowledge they have is called systems knowledge. And the decision maker form a minor part of the system, but they are very important. And they have target knowledge. They, have, they know what to decide and how to move forward. And therefore they bring target knowledge. And what is important in system thinking that you combine both these knowledge to inform the transformational knowledge that how we will change and how we will bring the change and bring these technical, social, legal, cultural, and all disciplines or objectives or, or say that impact on these outcomes then that is called transformational knowledge. And therefore we need to bring systems knowledge and target knowledge together. And here I will now stop. So this is my slide and I will stop and I will hand it over to Ku. Uh, no, sorry, Dr. Josh. Well, good morning to you. I'll first start sharing some slides, see if we can have a vision together. Hope you can all see this. Greetings from Western Europe. Good morning, good day, afternoon to all of you. Is my voice okay? Yes, it is okay. Okay, now I'm welcoming you here from the land of the Dutch, the Dutch mountains, as you see in our highway system, we are a very systemized, connected, closely connected country, even the most densely populated following Bangladesh. So when we consider systems thinking, we feel it every day. Yeah, our beautiful landscape, very closely connected to the industrial production consumption. We are crowded, we are busy, yeah, and we live literally back to back and shoulder to shoulder. So when we think about systems, and thank you, Dr. Renuka, for giving me so many points to grasp onto, but when we think about th systems, uh, we learn to see it as one holistic thing. And that's what I want to briefly uh, talk about now. And I'll keep that very short. Uh, please see this as a brief academic intervention on systems thinking. I would like to underline that indeed systems thinking is not novel. Right? It's not a new invention, but you already mentioned that. So I'm looking quite critical at its usefulness for sustainable development and our way forward. And I even doubt if we as humans are capable of handling all knowledge system thinking and which you so eloquently summed up, Dr. Renuka, all the knowledge system thinking provides us with I dare to question, can we handle that? For example, when we think about people, planet, profits, huh, we, we tend to see that as three dimensions that we can manage, that we can control. In my view, it's one world. Huh? It's one interconnected, even mess of interrelations. So we try to systemize things huh, that are perhaps even much more complex than we realize in our daily lives. If we look back briefly in the time of Aristotle and Plato in the Middle Ages here in Western Europe, we had those, we had decennia in which we believed we, we got it all together. You know, we understood the world and the moon and the sun, where things were going, the place of the church, our culture and our beliefs. Then in the enlightening phase, we started to reconsider. Uh, Plato came up again, uh, overruled Aristotle, and great thinkers said, well, knowledge should be about fixed things, about what we know about interconnections, causality, relations. Actually, we started rethinking in the early 1600s and say, yes, but even if that is so, if we promise ourselves entire understanding, our senses tell us reality is different. And I want to underline senses. I'll come back to that shortly. So, so knowledge, the absoluteness, became questioned. Uh, that's the birth of modern day science. Uh, if we look at, back at those days, and you mentioned that, Dr. Renuka, of course, systems thinking has been with us for, for, for thousands of years. Uh, look at our understanding of our own biology, health, of agriculture, uh, of more recently the economic systems. We already tried to describe everything in terms of systems, put that in books, 
created subjects and created disciplines. So it's not brand new. And you mentioned correctly that we need systems thinking to understand the long term and to, to, to realize what we do today, the effects for tomorrow, but especially for 50 to 100 years from now. But let's be critical about that also, because systems thinking already came to us in the early 70s. It was the time of the Beatles and the Stones, and of the war in Vietnam. Already then people thought about the systems thinking and you all, I think most of you, if not all of you read the limits to growth, imagine that this very prominent warning about unsustainable development dates back 50 years. Take a pause, for 50 years, we know what we're doing. And I would even like to state more than 50 years and still we are, ill in our actions. So that should puzzle our academic minds. Why? Is it so that we still, although we, we, we talk, we think about systems and interrelations, isn't it so that we are still seeking the linear solution? We still believe we can go from A to B in a linear line. So I question indeed if we can grasp all these different themes, subjects, disciplines, elements, this humble and jumble, if we can handle that. We don't, should delude ourselves, I think. If you, for example, take the very simple system or, of our organizations, of our institutes, I saw during my career that the various gears are not interlinked. You could reason if somebody's doing A, the other will do Z at a certain time, that's not so. The wheels are not interlinked, that grip is greasy or even broke, it's, it's, it is not logic. I'll briefly explain why that is, I think. So some wheels may slip, will not do what we think they do or what they are supposed to do. And look at our financial system today. It's not logical anymore. Our stock markets are going berserk. Interest rates are going berserk. We are completely shaken by a small virus at the moment. So let's be very critical because our lives, our welfare dimensions, our well-being, our relationship with Earth is also cluttered. We don't have a strict housing system or financial system. The way I see it is that all is interdispersed with small fractions of people with phenomena that we cannot control and perhaps we, we don't even see them today. So the picture is much more cluttered than many of us think. So we have this, and I, of course I'm hopeful, I'm positive. We have this strive to bring all these interrelations together, create a tree and create fruits and outcomes, steer our life and, and, and cure earth. But I think if, if you look at this picture, many of you will sense it's organic. It's not linear. It's completely interconnected. So it's not only systems interconnected in themselves and systems with systems. The whole thing is a breathing, moving organism. It's not standing still. And the delicate thing is, as soon as we touch it, as soon as we study it, it changes. We cannot measure without invoking change ourselves. So it's very questionable if we can go to the chalkboard of our universities or, or, or company rooms and boardrooms and say, okay, I'll, I'll take the chalkboard and I'll tell you how the system works. We should not delude ourselves there. What we can hope for is that we understand by now that our brain is transdisciplinary. We can think continuously with the speed of light on all these elements. It makes us, gives us a headache and it makes us uneasy and sometimes we don't understand anymore. But deep down inside, we have this capacity to interrelate, understand. And sometimes it's so complex, we just say to each other, we have this hunch feeling. I think I know, but I don't, I don't know why. There is the hope and this hope manifests itself in the youngest amongst us. I'm very much convinced of that. And that's what my research the previous eight years has been about. Youngsters, children, youth, have still this multicolored lens. 
they still associate. They're very fast thinkers. They are not wrought into our systems. They didn't take a place yet. They're still outside the linear thinking. So the hope I'd like to express, and I'll finish by that for, for today, is to unleash students' associative capacity and to generate new edu educators to help them do that. So the seed of change in my uh, view there, people, is in education. It is not in subjects, not in disciplines. It's even more than inter or multidisciplinary. It's about transdisciplinary reasoning about themes that define our future. All our knowledge should not be, let me say, quantified in systems that we, we generated as of today. But we should take those themes that define our world, uh, water, food, construction, health, uh, poverty, friendship. I think these main themes, the, these large drivers, that is what we should learn about anytime, any place, through any device and with anybody. So there's the mission. And that's the message I want to leave you with at this moment. Uh, how can we help our next generation to think integral? and be citizens of the world, changing this world as of today. Thank you very much. Hello, is, is everybody Hello. able to hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, it was very impressive uh, from <clears throat> Dr. Rinuka and Joss of uh, having presentations before me. And Joss, you have very colorful slides, almost as good as Van Gogh's paintings. So, <laughs> and this really lightened up uh, the, the, the presentation. I will very quickly go through from the business side uh, what we think of sustainability, systems thinking, and problem solving. Uh, I come from the business background, so I think this is the um, uh, the, the way uh, business people think about it. We would like to say that business people are naturally systems thinkers because they've got to consider several uh, topics at the same time. Now, um, I'd like to uh, let, let everybody know that the ASEAN countries, the counterpart to the European Union, has in October recently adopted a framework for a circular economy for the ASEAN economic community. And this is very recent and they have a framework with guiding principles and strategic priorities. Uh, it's an example of systems thinking in policy, in action, all across the ASEAN countries, including the Philippines. So they are looking at uh, various aspects with strategic priorities. This, this was um, to overcome the difficulties with the lean economy system. Uh, which we know has uh, been pervasive and there is the uh, wasteful part of it. And the whole idea is to uh, we have a regenerative, restorative and resilient economy that tries to minimize waste and increase uh, the usefulness of uh, all the materials within the system, so to speak, so that uh, we, we, we have um, a better effectiveness and use of uh, resources at our command. So as an introduction, this has been happening at the ASEAN level. Uh, as it is stated here, there are already initiatives taking place in every country, in every industry, but this is the first time that we're looking at it from the whole global level. Now, I'd like to um, give you three examples of how uh, systems approach has uh, been uh, taking place in the business sector. Uh, as you know, electronic products uh, have this thing called built-in obsolescence. And, uh, you know, it was at a time when there was an economic uh, recession and depression, uh, there were some laws made that allowed or encouraged companies to build in obsolescence so that uh, we can have more products and that people can, uh, can buy and we can have increasing uh, consumerism and, and, and economic growth. But what we have is, that, as you know, you buy one handphone today, you throw it away in the next three years, if not three months, you know. With the... So the challenge is, can we look at how uh, to design for the better uh, system whereby you conserve on resources. Uh, this is a challenge, for example, you want to insert eco design into a business model. Uh, this is where system thinking has to come in. Uh, and, and it is going to, you know, as the chart shows, uh, affect several areas from environmental, economic to the social aspects uh, of actually how you do things. And in terms of, let's say, sustainable electronics uh, design, uh, optimizing this design uh, becomes uh, an issue. And this is where the, you know, it's, it's almost difficult to ask the uh, iPhone, can we stop um, 
coming up with a new iPhone every one or two years, <laughs> stick to you know one model and, and have it uh, long lasting. And it all goes back to the consumer too. Uh, if the consumer is looking at um, uh, wanting a new feature every three months, uh, then you have difficulty. So you have to deal with expectations. And, and so it's a very complicated process. And uh, I think this is where starting with design, you have to look at how systems are affected by it and how to design, how to insert a design or eco-design into the thing. Now, um, the other area that I want to introduce is uh, sustainable agriculture. As you know, agriculture is uh, identified as a problem area, not only for food production, but for GHG emissions. So if you're looking at systems change at the meta level, how do you achieve a paradigm shift in farming? Uh, there are a lot of issues now affecting the climate. And as I said earlier, 30% of GHG emissions are attributed to uh, at the agriculture sector, and we depend on very few crops, uh, not enough range in the crops, and then we depend on a certain model where we deal with a lot of fertilizers and various things. I like to say that uh, we have farming systems. They were originally farming systems that were very uh, natural. The whole rural area uh, dealt with natural decomposition of composting, and we have very little fertilizer in the system, but uh, with the industrialization of agriculture, you have a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it, introduction of uh, artificial inputs like chemicals and pesticides. And you actually suppress the microbiome in the natural system. So when you look at the range of farming systems, we have the conventional system that suppresses the natural system, the microbiome, and it creates large-scale intensive agriculture and monocropping. And this really uh, has a lot of impact on the health of our soil and the type of crops that we can grow and the choices that are available to uh, the community at large. And we are trying to affect change away from this. We are looking at organic, natural farming and integrated farming. This, scale, this chart shows basically if you try to move from a conventional system to a non-conventional system, uh, you have to work at so many levels, supporting transformative systems while improving their performance for one, if you try to address organic, you can only rise so much, you cannot replace uh, the conventional system, let's say with organic uh, systems. And then you have stimulating demand for more sustainable products. You've got to encourage people to, you know, uh, get uh, to be used to uh, maybe your lettuce with a bit of insect holes instead of uh, all clean without any insect holes. <laughs> and to increase the incentivization of uh, incremental systems, improvement in all systems is a real big challenge. So this slide is basically to let you know how difficult it is to achieve a paradigm shift. My third area is in logistics. I have been advising on sustainable logistics as well. And when you look at logistics, there are so many technological factors that are going in now. And I'll run this through quickly. A lot of uh, the logistics companies are interested, for example, in uh, creating a whole ecosystem with which to work in, uh, from uh, assessment of what is possible to developing what should be in time to come, uh, and to integrate the whole concept, to partner with other parties, to set up a systems governance, an ecosystem governance. I use the word ecosystem here. It's very interesting because it's taken from biology, but it is adapted to a lot of technology systems at the moment. And this is an example of the elements that you get that you need to think of. Uh, you have digitization, you have the enablers, you have augmented reality, the, the various technologies itself. And, and you have various other aspects like the various dimensions of uh, uh, economics, environmental, and so social aspects. Uh, and you think in terms of an operation system, when you are actually operating as a manager or as a uh, company uh, executive within a logistics ecosystem, there are so many aspects that you will think of going from uh, in industrial 1.0 to 4.0, and I won't go into all these. The other is the rapid advances in technology require us to be looking at so many aspects, including 3D printing, or even robotics, or even drones to deliver, driverless cars, um, blockchain to look at traceability, cybersecurity to make sure that your logistics is not hacked and diverted somewhere else in the meantime. So you can imagine how complicated it is. And I'd like to end uh, by describing what I see as a circular economy model transiting into a more sophisticated urban metabolism model. Uh, as Joss and I think Dr. Renika mentioned, uh, one is that we can advocate for more systems thinking, but at the same time, 
it gets more and more complicated. It gets more and more difficult to handle. You have more and more complexity. But circular economy has been what we can handle so far. It's been promoted in the EU to um, develop policy frameworks with which to generate growth, uh, new growth. In fact, uh, the circular economy is considered the next trillion dollar industry or business or way of uh, operating. But um, there are limitations. It only maximizes, maximizes value of long value chain. You're looking at a mechanistic and reductionist work on you. And most important, I've read in a lot of critiques regarding social economy, uh, circular economy, you are basically maximizing economic value only within a social and ecological context. So you're looking and working in a capitalist framework as well. Uh, you're looking at profit maximizing, but reducing waste and all that. Whereas if you uh, graduate into an urban metabolic system, basically what this means is that as you move towards greater urbanization and we have more complexity, we are going to be, we are actually experiencing difficulties with handling this complexity. Mankind has not been able to handle the complexity of urban systems that we live in. And so what do we need? We need uh, advance in concept and uh, approach and perspective to handle this. And then system thinking offers that in the highest degree. You have several levels of scale, multiple levels of overlay from spatial, demographic, infrastructural, energy use, waste streams, even uh, geographical and temporal streams come into play. Uh, higher order interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary analysis is required. And you really want to capture the synergy between these value chains and layers. And what we hope for is to capture holistic value uh, for all the various parts of uh, the dimensions that sustainability represents. And with that, I'd like to end. I know my time is short. I hope I managed to capture it within the time frame. Uh, but uh, back to you, to the host, and thank you for letting me have my five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you to the members of the delivery team, Dr. Renu Katakor, Dr. Josh Yusen, and uh, Sir Ko. Hock on for such a comprehensive and insightful discussion on systems thinking and problem analysis. Uh, to our participants, let us give them our virtual claps. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, definitely our participants have surely learned a lot. Your discussions may have sparked some questions from our participants or at this juncture, our virtual floor is now ready for our for our open forum. You may want to type in your questions or comments via our chat box, or you are enjoying to unmute yourselves and ask your questions. This is a high time to get more information and insights from our delivery team. So the virtual floor is now open. So there are some comments here. Uh, they are appreciating the informative session from our speakers. Okay, can we have the first question from the group? Okay, so uh, based on the discussion of Dr. Takor, uh, ma'am, uh, you've mentioned, uh, can I give the first question, Dr. Renuka? Or you are on mute, ma'am? Yes, please. Yes. yes. Um, I am very curious about the theoretical framings that uh, you shared with us. Yes, ma'am. Uh, from the theoretical framings, uh, which based on your experience, ma'am, in terms of systems thinking, which is the most uh, challenging to, to manage in terms of systems uh, thinking application? I think, um, I think a political system, <laughs> political, <laughs> Perspectives is very uh, challenging to manage uh, for any common user because you know we are uh, when we are we, when we are in business we look at regulations we look at our employees we look at our external environment what is supply chain and so on but the political uncertainties are bring so much pressure nowadays that we are unable to keep hold on that sometimes. Okay. And right. I think uh, uh, Ku or Josh might also have something to add here. 
Thank you, Dr. Takor. Uh, would like to would just like to go first, or no? You go. You go first. Okay. Okay. Uh, I as I understand the question, it is which area of uh, systems thinking is most difficult. I yeah. think the my own opinion is that uh, when we run into systems thinking, we we run into uh, conventional thinking, and um, this is found in a lot in uh, business as usual in business. And they always think in terms of uh, their own silos in the areas that they think in. For example, uh, it is not easy to get a company to think in terms of a value chain where you think of an upstream and a downstream. Uh, so they stick to basically their system boundaries, as we mentioned earlier in the last lecture. And uh, they will basically ex not take into account the external costs and they still keep to uh, their own usual ways of doing things and, and calculating profits and not regarding the actual environmental or social cost. So that's, that's a very challenging uh, aspect. Uh, so I gather this would be in the area of uh, the community and the conventional business thinking. Whereas I think in the governmental policy levels, uh, they're more open to new concepts and they're open to looking at how to new, do new uh, policies. And I think they, they were more receptive and also the academic sector where all this research is being done. I, I hope you agree, Josh. <laughs> Perhaps I'd like to. Uh, yeah, very, very much so, uh, Cole. I, I even want to expand that briefly. I think that the biggest challenge with systems thinking, as far as we experienced, is that we chopped up our society. We boxed our society, so to speak. So we think indeed from islands and disciplinary silos, but we should realize we are creating them every day. So, there are two dimensions to this problem. We are in boxes. And if you take, observe the person within the box, uh, he or she is, play, is, is per definition uh, uh, performing, acting, playing a role from the institution. Uh, whether you're in a company, a municipality, university, NGO, you, you behave in a certain way. So the third dimension, the person herself mm -hmm. is not addressed enough. That's where I would like to base the transition of. So not the boxes, not the roles, but the people. And we are the people as we are gathered here today also. And the people are, are instructed through subjects and disciplines, are prepared to, to take a role in the machinery. So my advice is you should get out of the machinery in order to turn, to turn it around, to understand it. So the most positive, let's wake ourselves up all together. One more sentence, for example, with clothing and you know, just wearing a jeans today, we can try to understand the fashion system, which is full of power and influential people and money. But we can also decide to skip one fashion season. If we all together skip fashion for one season, we we manage to get the Paris Agreement done only through fashion. And that's us, the people, that can do that anytime. Thank you very much for uh, the responses from our delivery team. Okay, um, we have some questions here in the chat box. Uh, let me read this to the three speakers. Considering... Uh, the current dynamic, dynamically changing situations where we are faced with multiple challenges, how can systems thinking be utilized effectively when the dynamics are such rapidly growing and evolving? That's from, I, I hope I can pronounce the name, uh, Tushar Pradhan from India. Thank you, Thank you Tushar. Uh, very interesting question and very important. It, the society is dynamic just now. The current, uh, uh, current situation is so much dynamic. Now, systems thinking, I did touch on uh, one word, which is emergence. It has an emergence property. Now, sis through system thinking, we can predict some forecast, like we can forecast what will be the performance of our system one thing, if we know more 
about our system that is uh, we uh, there are less uh, of our understanding have less uncertainties any system as i already mentioned that uh, there are several models and several principles and several models must be applied to our system thinking not only one if we stick on socio technical system then we are uh, still limited but if we along with that if we apply complex adaptive system which has an adaptation to the situation and the emergence of that system uh, performance then we can be adaptive and we emerge and for all these we need strategic capabilities the capabilities to uh, increase our capacity to address these pressures coming from dynamics of the system and so uh, agents need to be very very effective leaders here understand their environment effectively and then govern uh, the system effectively so it also lies on the individual leadership taking ownership and being adaptive and trying to increase their strategic capabilities so these are the things that like people must be uh, ready they should always be ready for any problems that are coming up so i will stop here and i will add i will ask others to add Yeah, let, let, let me briefly add, uh, just see in the question uh, in the chat, uh, the word public-private partnerships, and you're completely right, uh, Dr. Renuka, that we need leadership, that we need strength, uh, that we need direction uh, and an integral view. Uh, um, but uh, let us think out loud also, but I just briefly remarked about the boxes. Uh, if we want to try the is, to put the boxes together, public-private partnerships or otherwise, we in, in the Netherlands actually were very famous about our democracy and getting everybody around the table and chatting and talking and doing the blah blah. That's typical the Dutch. We talk all day, but those times are gone. I think the the world is one place now. Is one place to live on all together. So partnerships is 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 of the past. I think we should emerge from our boxes. And we are bright and brilliant enough to do so. We don't need those role models. We don't need, the, as a brief example, if two companies decide to cooperate, that is something completely different than a merger. My uh, plea would be, Co, we, we need a merger. We don't need imperfect cooperation anymore because Earth has no time anymore to wait for us. We wasted decades and decades. Huh? So it is not a haste, there is no panic and there is no doom. But we should take the opportunity absolutely now to re-educate our youngsters to begin with and let them lead. Warn them not to march the streets on Friday. What a nonsense. It's a waste of capacity. We need youngsters and study food and water and health care for the elderly. If we now take up that challenge, imagine if we'd done that in 71. We would have had people my age uh, having had the chance to work like this for 40 years, but we wasted that opportunity. So my plea is think transdisciplinary, get out of the box, forget about partnerships, start learning again together. If, if I may, uh, Joss and Renuka, um, one of the things that I think is lacking so far in the planet today is holistic thinking, uh, especially among leaders, uh, government leaders, um, business leaders, uh, maybe up to a certain extent, community leaders. Uh, the holistic thinking here I define as uh, taking into account both the environment, the ecology, society, and everything in its perspective. Uh, think of it as a whole. We tend to think of everything too much in parts. Uh, we only take care of our own little part and that's okay, uh, but not enough holistic thinking. and. Uh, 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 holistic thinking is very much embedded in system thinking. You need to have that value system within uh, system thinking because you can have very good systems, but the system has to be in service of who and what. If it is in service of only a few, 
then it's not really holistic thinking. It must be in service of everybody. Then you need to have a very good objective in that sense. And in that sense, uh, the suggestion by Bella for public-private uh, community partnership. Public is the government sector. Private is the private sector. Where's the community in this? So it should be the public, private, and community partnership. Uh, that completes the holism and the holistic perspective that should be having. And I'd like to address uh, Tusha's uh, question. Things are getting more complicated and we are having multiple challenges, you know, to, to, to the issues and the problems that are arising. Can systems thinking effectively be utilized? Um, one is the leadership. One is the clear-headed perspective of holism. Everything goes into uh, the, the box and the, 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 the soups of the mix. And then the use of technology. Every day, uh, big data analytics, AI development, software capabilities enable us. Uh, I think of artificial intelligence as the prospective, prospective for human consciousness. We have, through all these tools now, ability to have a better grasp of systems. This is in a way directly replying to you, Josh, about your questions. Can we handle complexity? The technology today, I think, enables us to do that. And again, in service of who? In service, of course, uh, everyone on, as, if to benefit. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. I will just uh, add a few things here that, yes, we want holistic system. We want all this together. But the problem is, is that where we have quantitative data from AI and other things, we do not have qualitative data. Mm -hmm qualitative data, we do not have quantitative data. And therefore, these realistic decision-making are uh, a fall off in the sense of they do not reach the real outcomes. And therefore, I think each and every individual in the society needs to be aware of these things. We must take our time to think through and research through each and our activity, are we doing it actually the way we want to do it and is it is providing the outcome that we want it? And therefore, if we take some time, each and every person needs to be a researcher, needs to be a practitioner, and needs to be a little bit illiterate also around this. And if we all take our ownership, I think collectively, we will be able to help the government and the community and ourselves. So I will stop here now. Okay, thank you for your answers. Uh, do we have some more questions from our participants? I Okay, so let me read this. I think we all agree that systems thinking, interdisciplinary communications would need that we think out of the box, but how can these brilliant scientific and creative ideas and projects to be seen and accepted and acted upon by the present leaders in both government and the business coming from Mom Clarissa Floresca? Well, let, let me very briefly, uh, this uh, is a good question, absolutely, but it also pre presumes leaders in industry don't know, or politicians don't know, and do we have to tell them? Uh, I might assure you that politicians and industry leaders do know. So what we need is the impulse to get them moving. Uh, that now we judge we judged these leaders in their present role. So it is up to us to change our way of judging what they do. They're doing excellent jobs. It only doesn't fit together in sustainability terms, but they really know what they do. For the example of the jeans, I am absolutely sure the major producer of fashions know exactly how they are wasting the world. But as long as we buy the jeans, we are the producers. We are the consumers. So my advice would be, my thinking, go one step beyond a question like this. Exactly, I will agree. And that's why my previous point was there, that we each and individual must be thinking what we are doing. And we all together can have that pressure on the government or the other policies or anything that can change the world. So yes, 
we must uh, like it, it is always said isn't it the change comes from yourself like you have to be changed if you want the change yeah and and exactly that is what we should be doing thank and you ex exactly renuka and josh i quite agree in fact uh, i used to serve a lot on various high level global boards for sustainability and everybody was working from a top down approach trying to get from the industry to frame standards and practices and get the rest of everybody to follow but it's not working you're not getting enough uh, buy in and just as i said maybe at the last uh, session we had uh, i i wonder whether it was before cop uh, when politicians get into the act uh, of discussion and negotiation they are tied in their hands are tied by their constituencies their constituencies are telling them we can only accept this and not more so it's just a horse trading and a buttering and in the end we get a very watered down version of what's needed for the rest of the world so you cannot i say given that situation you cannot expect too much from the business leaders nor the uh, political leaders but what you can do is take it into your own hands like what josh is saying uh, work at the community level and create movements and create enough momentum that you can make an influence on the political leaders that they have can have their hands tied behind their back their hands have to be free the people have to speak and business leaders have to listen to consumers we don't buy fashion for one season <laughs> and you know uh, you can have a sustainable lifestyle you can have a sufficient lifestyle you don't need to have a over sufficient lifestyle so it's all a personal choice and we can actually do a lot more uh, individually collectively when we do each of us individually in the same way we are collectively acting i think that's more to be achieved yeah. thanks and, uh, thank you very much Cohen. as uh, adding to that uh, uh, tiny fragment that's why we believe in youth yeah because our conscience uh, our present conscience the way we were educated our experience made cowards of us all <laughs> a great poet once said that you know a danish poet William Shakespeare, and he was right. He was actually a perfect people assessor. Eh? Mm. And we should, you should not take that as an offense, eh? but we all are cowards if, if we don't take the opportunity to have our children at least understand how they can act. So I, I often propose everybody 30 plus should, should shut up and get <laughs> at the side. <laughs> and support. I, 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 tell, I tell youth, Uh, the young people that you are trendy so try, try to be trendy in sustainability <laughs> try to do th different things and people will follow you so exactly that is the main and youth. perhaps only reason yeah. renuka why we got together here at baliuk university to, to <laughs> so get thank this you going. very much everyone i think it was a wonderful wonderful discussion and uh, thank you very much Hey, uh, thank you very much uh, to the members of the delivery team. Well, if you have some more questions or comments, uh, you may, of course, you can always email the uh, committee of this uh, webinar. Okay. Um, once again, to the members of the delivery team, uh, thank you very much. Maraming salamat. Uh, in uh, Filipino here in the Philippines for generously answering the questions of our participants. Thank you as well to the participants for your active participation. Once again, let's give the members of the delivery team our virtual applause. Um, at this juncture, may I now request your cooperation in evaluating our webinar. Kindly check the chat box for the evaluation link. Please answer the evaluation before the end of our program. To those who have questions on how you can get your electronic certificate, e-certificates will be directly emailed to us, to the participants. Only those who, who will complete or who completed the six sessions will be given a certificate of participation in Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. All right, so we are almost done with our second webinar. The members of the delivery team have more in store for all of us, envisioning the empowerment of our participants to take an active role in shaping a sustainable future. On that note, we are all heading to the remaining webinar topics. So we are done last November in the introduction to sustainability just today. 
systems thinking and problem analysis. By next year of January 14, we will have the meaning and impact of the SDGs, followed by sustainability leadership, then global sustainability and corporate social responsibility, and finally, leading sustainable transformation. Please be informed that just like the first webinar just uh, we held last November, a learning evaluation in a form of a quiz will be emailed to all of us. We enjoin everyone to answer the quiz. Just an information, there will be a culminating activity at the end of this webinar series in April 2022, wherein we will know as well the results of the quizzes to be emailed to us as participants. We now come to the end of our webinar, inspired and motivated to come together for a sustainable future. Just a reminder to all our participants, we shall have our group picture taking in a while. For the formal closing of our event, let me now give the virtual floor to Dr. Flordeliza A. Castro, the Vice President for Academic Affairs of Baliwag University, Philippines, for her closing remarks. Dr. Castro. Thank you, Dr. Tayao. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Tayao, this is the second series among the six lecture series that we will be holding for Baliwag University and the delivery team of the Shaping Sustainable Future Together series. So in behalf of uh, the delivery team and the entire Baliwag University community, we'd like to say thank you to the participants this afternoon. And we'd like to also thank no, the president of the university for supporting all the projects of the university as part of the internationalization of the institution. Again, we'd like to say thank you to Dr. Renupa. I learned a lot from your lecture about sustainability systems thinking. Uh, Dr. Jos, as you said it, let us unleash our students and make them think out of the box and that we should go from interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary system in education. Uh, on the business side, I was able to learn a lot from Dr. Ku regarding sustainable business model, sustainable agriculture, a shift in terms of paradigm shift, in terms of farming should really be done. And then I think the last one is your ecosystem building process, no? So as mentioned by Dr. Nyoroka, there are several systems thinking principles and I'd like to reiterate and give emphasis to the last one, that we are part of the system. Again, as reiterated by Dr. Ku and Dr. Yusen, and together, no, if we work together, we would be able to really sustain all these 17 sustainable goals as the mentioned to us at the first part of the lecture series last uh, month. Again, in behalf of the university, we'd like to say thank you to everyone. We have four more series to attend to. And at the end, we are happy to announce as mentioned by Dr. Tayao that you'll be receiving your certificates of participation. So again, let us see together, it's other again together on January on February, on March, and your graduation on April 2022. Maraming salamat po. I should say it in Filipino, in the Philippines. Maraming salamat. The English version is thank you. And again, we'd like to say Merry Christmas to everyone and advance Happy New Year. Thank you, everyone, and good day. Good night and good evening and good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Castro. May I now request everyone to kindly turn on your cameras for our group picture taking. Alex returned home. Okay. All right, uh, I'll be in charge of taking the picture. So kindly please again, if we, we may request everyone to turn on your cameras and uh, of course, uh, show your beautiful smile. Excited for the holidays, right? Yes. Okay, for a while. Okay, in the count of three, one, two, three. I'm in the first frame. One, two, three. 
Okay, can you hold your smile while I copy it in my file? First frame. I'm now in the second frame. Then again, we request everyone to turn on their videos if you can. And then third frame. One, two, three, smile. Okay. Thank you so much, okay, everyone. Done. Uh, we have our second group picture taking. We'll have more to go. Thank you very much for your active engagement. Let's be challenged to expand our horizons on problem solving and opportunity seeking. Again, I am Hasmin Tayao from Baliwag University, Philippines. See you all in the third webinar this January 14, 2022. Happy holidays and a safe, prosperous, and sustainable new year to all. <laughs>